and welcome to Nancy Graham, the Space Ranger. My name is Brian Sexton and this is going to be chapter 35. Now, if you haven't been following or has just clicked on this episode, uh, the story's a little bit long in the tooth now to do a recap. So if you do like it, please, by all means, jump back to the start and see if you can follow it through. And if you have been following, thanks very much. So no more messing. A hen, a door, a tree, and away we go. The problem with being a little bit lazy when you are a Sosniak patrol leader is that there are not too many ways of dosing. In fact, there is only one way of dosing, and that is to volunteer your crew to monitor the terrestrial activity in a barren and uninhabited part of Jupiter. Which is why Sosniak patrol leader Frumbernick Garachnil volunteered himself and his crew to watch over the barren and uninhabited Canclonic Expanse. Now, the problem with volunteering your crew to monitor an area where nothing ever happens is that they can become quickly bored and then demotivated and then belligerent and say things like, I will in me hole when you order someone to close the anterior cargo door of your rocket ship or stick that record up your arse when you say you will record the belligerence. Still, it is a small price to pay for a quiet life, a life away from possible Hobbit-Granager Defence League attacks or hassled from Sosnik Central Control. In fact, in the seven years Sosnik Patrol Leader Flumberdink Garachnil had supervised the airborne survey of Canclonic, his spotters had only ever recorded seeing two things, a hibernating robot and an extraterrestrial. Patrol Leader Flumberdink, we have spotted an extraterrestrial, looks to be headed for the stormy hills, announced the chief spotter. Yeah, bollocks, added the chief spotter after a brief pause. He wanted Flumberdink to be sure of how he viewed his patrol leader. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that last part, replied Sosnik patrol leader Flumberdink Garachnil. Well then I'm going to pretend I had to repeat what I just said so you did hear it. Flumberdink paused. His vocabulary temporarily failed him. An extraterrestrial, he asked after a short but mildly tense silence. Yeah, an extraterrestrial. We're in the same uniform as Chancellor Staunton. So probably an extraterrestrial. If not, then a cantabular glimp in disguise. A glimp in disguise? Why would it do that? Ah, glimps are always disguising themselves. I heard of a glimp that disguised itself as a glimp, sir. Are you trying to be smart? Probably best if one of us is. Are you going to go and detain the extraterrestrial or not, Flumberdink? Hang on, said Flumberdink, before initiating another short moment of silence. He filled the silence with the realisation that capturing an extraterrestrial would be a pretty big deal in the eyes of the top brass at Sosniak headquarters. And that after seven years of dossing, there was the strong chance that he, along with all his crew, would be promoted, or at the very least rewarded, for one brief evening of activity. We should apprehend and detain the extraterrestrial, said Flumberdink finally, and then plot a course to Sosman City. And then Radio Central Control to tell them we have apprehended and detained an extraterrestrial. And are returning to Sosniak City. And, uh, well, uh, that the extraterrestrial has admitted to being the commander from the second human interstellar craft. Uh, and has an extensive knowledge of physics. And is happy to reveal this knowledge to Sosman himself. The last two parts of the dictated message were at best optimistic versions of what may or may not have been true. The chief spotter knew that, but didn't really care one way or the other. He nodded, muttered the word twat, and then went about gloomily carrying out his instructions, which involved getting the pilot to set the rocket ship down on the narrow, windy, shingle path European Space Agency Mission Commander Catherine Bishop had been following through the area of Canclonic Expanse known as Shan Laba Feistin, and sending a party of three Sosniak guards out through the already open anterior cargo door to escort the extraterrestrial to the brig which was, in itself, no small deal. But fortunately for the spotter, he had delegated the task and left the subsequent wrestling, screaming and kicking to the guards, who dragged the unwilling Catherine Bishop into the rocket through the open anterior cargo door and into a detention room adjacent to the cargo bay. And hearing patrol leader Flumberdink Garachnil say, Hey, close the anterior cargo door! And telling patrol leader Flumberdink Garachnil, Now it's yourself, you lazy streak of piss. And then listening to the patroller complaining to the guards that the head spotter was getting cheeky and would be reported to headquarters. The chief spotter then escorted patroller Flumberdink to see the prisoner, which involved standing in front of a mesh open wall on one side of the rectangular detention room and pointing to European Space Agency Mission Specialist Catherine Bishop and saying, That's the prisoner, Flumberdink. So as the patrol leader Flumberdink Garachnil then joined his less than jovial chief spotter in front of the mesh open wall and was asked, 
Who the hell are ye people? What's going on? By the prisoner. Now, these were the two foremost questions European Space Agency Mission Commander Catherine Bishop had. Her circumstances had changed rapidly over the course of roughly two minutes. It was late evening. She'd been headed for low hills along a shingled path on an exposed rock boulder strewn plain, away from a homicidal but now hibernating robot. The three travelling companions she set out with had mysteriously disappeared and had been replaced by a strong but brief eggy smell on Jupiter. The rapid change in circumstances involved her being bundled into an alien rocket ship by three light blue uniformed humanoids and placed in a small square room with a shiny white metal bench to sit on. The interior of the rocket was lit by dim recessed white lights. One of the walls had a grill that opened into a large room filled with a messy collection of half open boxes and about a four metre wide hinged door that opened down to the elements outside. Directly outside the grill on one wall of her room were two male humanoid extraterrestrials. One was tall, sleepy looking and said, We are Sosnik Patrol 45381B, Can Clonic Detail. And you are being transported to Sosman City as a prisoner of the great Sosman Borkstapel. The other humanoid was smaller, rounder and shrugged and nodded half-heartedly in agreement as the tall, sleepy one spoke. Catherine thought for a minute. She tried to take stock of her situation. She had been, for the most part, unhurt by the struggle to detain her. The craft she was on appeared to be moving quickly. She looked out the open four metre wide door and could see the planet's surface below her change from exposed rock to low hills to open grassland to thick purple forest canopy. There was nothing in her European Space Agency training or extensive knowledge of the solar system that would help her identify where she was. Uh, why is Sazman Borkstapel great? She asked finally. It probably wasn't the most urgent thing she needed to know, but her rapid change in circumstances had left her confused and looking for any information that might help explain what was happening. The two humanoids nodded lazily in unison and shrugged. He invented the snotagomble, said the tall, lazy-looking one. The smaller one shrugged and rolled his eyes. Catherine sat down on the metal bench. Do you have a toilet? she asked. Just go on the floor if you have to, said the tall, lazy one. The first spotter will clean up the mess. I will in me hole, muttered the smaller one. Catherine thought about her business and then decided she could hold on for a bit longer. She then thought about the business of the humanoids who captured her. They seemed less than enthusiastic about that business, whatever it was. The pair walked away from the mesh and towards a small door at the opposite end of the room of messy half open boxes. This meant the open large door at one end was to Catherine's right and the two humanoids were walking away to her left. The gate was loped, slow and lazy, and was a marked contrast to the object that shot in through the large four metre wide hinged door. Now, what happened next happened quickly. The noise of a Tomagolodian axe flying in through the open cargo door of a Sosniak low level planetary cruiser and piercing the cover to the antimatter chamber and making contact with and shattering the Aldernon crystal shard used to generate power for the cruiser is Kralalunk! The rocket lurched violently sideways and dropped the 30 or so feet to the top of the purple tree canopy below, before crashing down through the trees. At least Cathy imagined that was happening. She had gone from confused to dazed and was struggling to find her breath. From what she could tell, she had not been injured by the crash. The artificial lighting inside the cruiser disappeared the moment she heard Gralalagonk! And all Cathy could make out was what she could see from the few beams of light reaching in through the open cargo door which was now horizontal and facing out onto thick ground vegetation and forestry, and the unconscious two humanoids that had been lazily questioning her lying not far to the left of the now broken mesh that had been keeping her trapped. Come out, ye Sosniak scumbag, so I can kill ye, yelled a voice. No, came several muffled replies from deeper inside the broken rocket, somewhere to Cathy's left. A lanky figure in an orange boiler suit clambered through the open door and into the twisted mess of metal that was now the rocket interior. Cathy watched as the humanoid darted past and further into the rocket. There were several groans and screams and then silence. The orange boiler suited figure emerged carrying a bloody axe and made to swing it at the larger of the two unconscious humanoids that had been questioning Cathy. Stop it! yelled Cathy. Is that you, Nancy? What are you doing hanging out here with a bunch of Sosniaks? said the orange boiler suited bloody axe wielding humanoid. Did, did you just say Nancy? Typical human, answering a question with a question. Human? Uh, are there others? Asked Cathy. She strained and failed to recognise the stranger. Well, there's there's loads of them in art. I'm guessing there is. You look different, Nancy. Did you do something with your hair? No, no. Uh, are there humanoids here? No, you didn't do something with your hair. Or no, you're not Nancy. Yes, there are other artists. Well, there's two of them. And you. Unless you're Nancy. Don't know I've had a good look. You do look different. Did you say Nancy? 
Yes, Nancy McGinley of the European Space Agency on Earth. Though uh, we call her Good Aim, what with her skill with the crossbow. Where did you meet her? I met her in the forest of Proverbs, said the orange boiler-suited stranger. I could have sworn you were Nancy. You have the same number of arms and all. My eyesight must be going. Though I did take out an alder and crystal shard through a solid wall inside a moving rocket ship with the throw of an axe. So not too bad. Although those Sosnick Muppets did leave the cargo door of their rocket open. Still, you take your chances when you can, don't you? Catherine blinked. Nancy and who else? You said one more. Uh, Bart. Bart McMorrow. The pair of them wanted to kill Sosman Barksapple. That's why I'm surprised you're hanging out with the Sosnicks. What would you be in a human and all? Well, I'm probably exaggerating by saying they wanted to kill him. They weren't friends with him though, and that's good enough for me. So, you see, it's a truth be told, I was pretty disheartened about the Hobble of Defence League. Ever since that row with Mark and Aram yacked over the travelling show about the Dragon Braden split us up. So I was delighted to team up with those four enemies of Sosman, even if they were extraterrestrials. And, to be honest, it's great to have them on side. Especially now, since Markador, Yumlon and Mjakta Flart are in pieces inside Breezy McGasbuck's Muffledorf chest. Catherine went silent. She tried and failed to process what she had just been told. Did you say four extraterrestrials? She said finally. Yes, Nancy, Bart, Martina and the Sheriff, replied the stranger. Catherine made several attempts at a follow-up question. Well, were they all like, uh, so one of them was a Sheriff? And they wanted to kill uh, Susman. Uh, where are they now? Her efforts were rewarded with a question. Who? Bart, Nancy, Martina or the Sheriff? Cathy was about to reply with all when the stranger said, It's hard to know where Bart is because he went off in a huff with the ladder of insignificance. He could be standing in here with us right now and we just wouldn't have noticed. Although I'd say that's unlikely. Hard to know where Nancy is. I thought for a minute she was you. But the last I knew, she headed away off in the labyrinth of Chanticle yesterday morning. But anyways... The Sheriff has formed an underground army of darkness. That's who I'm with now. We're working on a logo, but it's probably going to be a cantabular glip ripping the head from a furry holontiker while glaring out at the future. That wasn't my idea though, that was the Sheriff. He reckons it sends out the right message. Sorry, uh, and Martina is back in the labyrinth. She runs a canteen now down there, and the food is top class. I'm headed there now. It'll be time for supper soon. By the way, my name is Gungolliger Unterwackel, but most people call me Bip. Uh, do you know anything about spacecraft, uh, uh, Catherine? Yes, yes I do. I'm an astronaut. Great. Could you get this thing to fly? Myself and the noobs are supposed to be up on the surface commandeering Sosniak equipment for the underground army of darkness. But I only really know about forestry and magic, and the noobs are really only good at digging tunnels. Cathy looked around at the twisted and crumpled metal internal structure of the rocket. She could not make out very much. The ship had been constructed of some sort of metal alloy. There had been trunken and several large pipes attached to the ceiling. She was sure they played an important role in the rocket's operation, but from what she could tell, they were all destroyed by the impact of the crash to the surface. I, I don't think so, she replied. Cathy stepped out of the square room she had been detained in, which was not difficult. One of the walls was missing without a trace, and the mesh between the cell and the larger room was in several pieces. The craft looks to have been very badly damaged, she added. The stranger known as Bip shrugged. Ah, I see he said. Pity. We could have done with a rocket. All we have to fight the Sosniaks with at the moment are pickaxes, axes uh, and tasty stew. Would you take a look at the outside of the rocket? Maybe there's something out there you could use to get the thing working again. Cathy nodded and silently followed Bip through the broken cargo door to a thick vegetated forest floor. She took a quick stock of what she could see, which was about half a dozen humanoids in ragged clothing enthusiastically battering the remaining intact parts of the rocket with axes thick vegetation and trees in every direction. Countless broken pieces of the rocket embedded at various heights in the surrounding trees along a clearing the rocket gouged through the forest canopy. Eh, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm only familiar with human rockets really. European Space Agency rockets, uh, and the San like a series in particular. I don't see anything familiar in what's left of this one. So no, I can't help you, uh, Bip. Cathy then gestured around her. But in any case, I'd say this one is damaged beyond repair. Fair enough, noted Bip. Just thought I'd ask, are you hungry? Cathy was very hungry, very hungry indeed. Yes, she said. Good stuff, replied Bip. Come on, so, let's get supper. You can catch up with your buddies Martina and the Sheriff. Cathy thought about mentioning that she did not know either of them, but then thought about the possibility of a meal, and followed Bip as he headed into the undergrowth. Bip looked over to the raggedly clothed humanoids battering the broken rocket parts as he walked. Lads, I know it's your first day and all, but the Sheriff wanted us to grab one of these things so he could use it as a weapon. So ye battering at the bits doesn't help at all, especially when it's already in bits. Come on, tomorrow's another day. Follow me and this one back to the labyrinth. Martina will probably have supper ready. Bit then holstered his axe and leaned in towards Cathy and gestured at the noobs. They had ceased 
bashing the broken Sosnet rocket parts and were now proudly marching over to the small gap in the undergrowth where Bip and Cathy were walking. Those lads might look like a bunch of idiots, but mark my words, they'll make a great army one day, so don't steal any of their stuff. Um, I won't, promised Cathy. And that was it for the late evening of the fifth human expedition to another planet. A wrecked Sosnet patrol rocket, a homicidal robot, a witch, European Space Agency mission specialist Bart McMorrow, Nancy Goodaim McGinley, supper, and the last remaining copy of the Book of Bongerlung adrift on the Sea of Uncertainty on Jupiter. Okay, thank you for listening once again, and uh, if you stuck with that, fair play. And the next chapter, 36, will have a throwback to the sort of the a real story or the backstory to this. And um, it's because the story is written on a nine-beat rhythm, so it's going to be 56 chapters in total and a throwback every nine chapters. If that makes any sense, if any of this makes any sense. But anyway, thank you for listening and uh, chat to you in two weeks.